uh, let me uh, thank Professor Park and Yuja again for having me here. And also special thanks to uh, Joey and other colleagues from IEMS. You made this event happen. Thank you very much. So today uh, I'm going to address a very simple question. How to understand the performance of Chinese uh, finance, financial institutions supervision of uh, its overseas projects. Well, BRI is just a label, not really about BRI, uh, if you can see from my case. Okay, now let me move on to the structure. So I'm going to provide you some interesting empirical observations, uh, quantitatively and qualitatively, while uh, simply jump onto the analytical framework before uh, touching on the case study in details. Well, I, uh, and after that, I will summarize my finding and make the conclusions and implications, all right? Now, um, the first empir uh, empirical observation I want to show you is that since from 2004, uh, in this table, if you can see, since 2004 to 2012, uh, the Chinese government actually have uh, ha ha had reformed the domestic financing uh, regulations uh, Particularly in 2012, the China Banking Regulation Commission had this uh, guideline on green credit, which is even considered as one of the most you know, advanced and most stringent lending practices compared to uh, international, uh, international uh, organizations. Uh, what is special about this uh, G, uh, GGC? Uh, one thing is about the veto uh, mechanism. They can block any uh, financing practices if they find out, uh, you know, problems on environmental, you know, protection violation, or on inappropriate, inappropriate uh, land acquisition, acquisition, things like that. Okay, so that's one empirical observation. We've seen China has been trying to adapt to the norm, international norms uh, as early as uh, 2000. And the second observation is, I think because, well, I'm not very sure about, you know, the direct correlation between um, the BRI and the Chinese domestic reforms, but clearly since the Belt and Road Initiative, we've seen the Chinese government's massive efforts on improving its financing uh, regulation, particularly in 2017, where the Chinese government, you know, uh, with different um, governmental entities, they uh, issued they issued 10 uh, regulations or policies in regarding uh, financing uh, supervision, okay? So from 2013, when the BRI was initiated, the Chinese government had completed around, uh, had complete, completed 20 uh, financing regulations and policies. So that's an empirical observation too. We've seen China has been making efforts. And the third interesting thing is, well, it's still incomplete, but I want to show you the, Infra infrastructure projects from 2002 to last up to last year, um, there are problematic uh, prob problematic Chinese finance projects that fail to observe uh, the green uh, the guideline on the green credit, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, during this uh, 17 years period, there were like 23 uh, projects explicitly violating the uh, GGC. Okay. So let's move on to the fourth uh, observation. Uh, it's about the number of observations in terms of year. So after the BI was initiated, we've seen the numbers uh, are not very significant, uh, particularly after uh, 2017. There were only, uh, you know, one, each one case identified in, in 2018 and 2020. But again, the number can be increased because, um, you know, those are basically manual, you know, um, uh, accumulated from media reports and verification with some existing database. Uh, so yeah, it's just a benchmark to give you an understanding uh, what it looks like of uh, the violation. But let's move on to the qual quality, uh, qual qualitative um, analysis. I, I'm very sure you are familiar with the negative narratives on Chinese BII financing. Um, you know, the common accusations are limited transparency, inadequate assessment on social and environmental impact, right? And of course, uh, like uh, the vulnerability to corruption in the case of uh, of the China, uh, China uh, one of the China Chinese SOEs companies uh, bribery case in Bangladesh, etc. Maybe you think it's biased by the Western media, but let's move on to the development research center of the Chinese State Council. They've just published an article uh, by Professor Tao 
that uh, they identify the four common areas of, of uh, problematic Chinese infrastructure financing. Okay, one is um, is of course uh, the uh, you know um, the the green you know greenery issues and then transparency and corruption issues as well as you know uh, inappropriate financing or loans terms things like that and and other than those two uh, you know um, narratives we've also seen the backlashes right uh, we've covered this yesterday uh, in in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, and and you know, uh, spread it out to even to Latin America. So, based on those uh, observations, I think there's a clear contrasting picture. So, I want to raise the research question: Why, you know, despite the government's attempts to issue uh, various regulations, the sustainability performance of China's uh, overseas financing is still ex explicitly weak? There are many answers to that. Um, I'm not going to elaborate on that, but I think uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, gap is one of the gaps is uh, the particular attention paid to the financiers uh, of of Chinese policy banks. Okay, so I give special attention to the identity analysis. Uh, while similar, you can use the identity uh, analysis, you know, uh, to analyze the SOE's behavior. But I think uh, they are still. Uh, very different in terms of, of tracking their records. So I argue that China's implementation of, sustainab uh, of sustainable development financing is handicapped primarily by the conflicting identities of itself in the supervision uh, process. So what, I, what do I mean by dual identity? A uh, very simple, I, I elaborate on my paper, but not really here. It's just, you know, based on, based on the current research where people uh, or scholars usually generalize the SOEs and including those uh, policy banks into, you know, categorize them into political and economic, you know, identities. These dual identities um, actually, you know, when, uh, when, it, when it comes to the, implement, when it comes to the uh, long, uh, long application, they can be, these identities can be hijacked by both Chinese SOEs and the actors in the financing, uh, foreign financing designation. For example, the foreign governments uh, or the foreign business community groups. And last is, um, because of the whole of government approach, the activities of the Chinese financing, uh, of course, including Chinese SOEs, will uh, imply political, economic, and diplomatic uh, implications on Chinese uh, overseas financing. One example is the China ASEAN Investment Corporation Fund. It's a sovereignty fund uh, supported by uh, the Exim Bank, import and export, uh, export and import Bank of China. Uh, one of the major uh, driving force for this, for this fund is to promote China's uh, economic incentives to, you know, uh, bring out the group good wheels and economic cooperation opportunities with the uh, regional partners all right now let's let me move on to uh, assessment on the dual identity first of all uh, Chinese dual identities uh, is uh, obviously may you know inhibit normal commercial decision making because the largest clients uh, of itself are from the SOEs or at least from the government linked companies right and some of the SOEs uh, uh, especially in the construction sector, uh, the, the saturation of the domestic market may force them to make very unreasonable uh, deals overseas. For example, the Six Bureau Group of uh, China Railway Engineering Company uh, Corporation in Vietnam. So, but because of the state-backed projects, the Chinese banks may be less able or even be less willing to do the due diligence uh, as the a normal financial uh, entity. So that's, that's one thing. And second is because of its uh, political you know, uh, identity, the Chinese uh, policy banks, they are also uh, able to conduct the neutral and independent assessments of those uh, proposals. But next is, um, which I think is more uh, problematic, uh, not really problematic, but more controversial uh, in terms of constrain itself from uh, playing a positive role is there is no clear boundary uh, for those Chinese policy banks to, uh, you know, to identify how to conduct the modern accountability uh, governance. I give you a, an example of the China Development Bank's uh, annual, annual report. So in their annual report since, uh, since 2000, I think 2018, they 
clearly identify, you know, uh, uh, they clearly uh, claims to strengthen and integrate the, politi uh, the party leadership and the political studies into the performance of the corporate governance as a daily life activity. So it, that may, what does that mean? That means the managers of the financial of, of the CDB, right, uh, could be uh, trapped in balancing the political tasks as well as you know the I, those ideology or uh, or political studies uh, together with uh, the daily uh, you know business operations. So this actually uh, constrains them from developing uh, necessary skills to to uh, for those overseas lending, all right? And la the last point I want to highlight is there's no prominent incentives for Chinese uh, banks, uh, which it should do uh, to engage with uh, the local community. Uh, there, there are several reasons. Of course, one of the most uh, familiar um, narrative is about the China's non-interference and non-strings attached uh, foreign policy. But I think there's the other thing, uh, very interesting, is the single mind on the consequences because of domestic political tightening. I, ha I conducted several, you know, on the ground interviews with with uh, people, uh, with, the, with the Chinese uh, managers uh, overseas, and they feel the concentration of um, uh, they feel the concentration of power uh, of the central government, and they also feel, you know, some political, you know, activities uh, has uh, framed them into a dilemma whether they should, you know, do public relations activities, and they feel the more they speak, uh, the the more mistake mistakes they will make, or the more, you know. Um, uh, shortcomings they will expose to the public and they will uh, again uh, make them embroiled uh, in a difficult situation especially when the when the destination uh, investing destination uh, has uh, has complicated complicated sentiment towards Chinese uh, investments so that's the one particular thing I want to I want to highlight about the political domestic political tightening on its uh, overseas, uh, you know, uh, business and lending activities. Uh, I give you an example on how, how uh, those domestic dynamics have impact, have differentiate, differentiate, uh, ha has differentiated uh, Chinese policy banks from others. One example is the International Finance, um, Finance, Financing uh, Center, where it is uh, held uh, for the free prior uh, informed and consensus standards. Uh, it's very difficult for the Chinese policy banks to, uh, to accept that. One of the issue is, is the human rights uh, uh, violations as one of the assessment to approve the project. And I give you the other example of the equator uh, principles, which is a totally voluntary basis, uh, you know, um, uh, initiative and a lot of international uh, banks they accept that including um, a standard chart for example however so far there were only four private Chinese uh, banks uh, adopting these uh, equator principles where there's no uh, Chinese uh, state state uh, link uh, state owned policy or policy banks uh, have been able to uh, adopt this principle. I have asked around why, you know, those banks um, find it difficult to ad adopt. One of the reasons is, is some of the norms, it will be difficult for them to manage and to muddle through, you know, uncertainty, uncertain consequences from the political, uh, political dynamics back home. So those are the uh, assessment of, uh, of the dual identity. Now, let me move on to, I think it's case study. But, Okay, let me move on to the mise en I think it's a very familiar case for those who uh, study Chinese uh, overseas financing. Well, I want to highlight, you know, uh, I want to use this case to, uh, as a comparison on the case uh, that categorize, that, that they are categorizing the BI to see, you know, there are some similarities and large, large portion of similarities uh, despite those Chinese regulations. So I'm gonna skip the background information just to save time, but I want to highlight, you know, uh, the issues of the project is uh, it clearly, uh, the project itself uh, clearly violated the China, China's uh, Exim Bank's guideline for the environment and social impact assessment of loan project, which was launched in 2007. Uh, one of the example is, the Chinese company, China Power Investment at that time, 
they conducted, they did conduct, uh, conduct the EIA and SIA uh, research and surveys, things like that, which was not required by the Myanmar government at that time. So they didn't violate anything, uh, didn't violate any regulations or law of the Myanmar government. Actually, they can be considered as an advanced group, as an advanced effort. However, they only issue this, uh, you know, uh, release this report uh, after the construction had already had already began, and that was clearly, uh, you know, uh, a violation of the guideline, which requires the release of report prior to the construction of the of the project. All right, and because of you know. Um, lot of complicated issues uh you know the defiance of the chinese company is uh, at at the initial stage and also because of heavy reliance on the host government uh, and 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 due to the domestic you know uh, politics of myanmar government where the, this dam was built on this um armed control uh, ethnic um group controlled uh conflict zones so the mission dam was protested uh, while together with the Mison Dam, there were other several Chinese finance pro projects were being contested, being protested, and even suspended. One of them is the Sino Myanmar uh, Railway. So let me move on to the approach of the bank. Uh, it's very difficult to investigate uh, the reactions and approaches of the bank. Uh, but interestingly, I can get the sense that you know uh, the Chinese, uh, the the, the Exim Bank shared similar sentiment with with the Chinese company. One thing is, at that time, uh, they had the belief uh, that that you know they had the belief of the develop developmentalism, which which they drew the lesson from uh, from the Chinese uh, you know domestic markets. They believed the monetary uh, incentives uh, should be you know should be. Uh, an acceptable, you know, uh, a concept for the local community. So uh, they felt very uh, unfair, you know, even though they they gave out the compensations, uh, they didn't understand why the local community still protest against it. And then, uh, of course, uh, the they stay away from those demonstrations because they consider it as internal affair of the Myanmar and they rely on the rely on the the. The military government to you know uh, tackle with those protests, um, but what is different from the Chinese uh, company uh, from the Chinese bank is at that time the China Power uh, Invest uh, China Power Investment they were very uh, they were very um, very uh, prompt in terms of um, long launching this public relation campaign while together with the China Embassy by making it more transparent and making it more engaged with the local community. However, you, you will find it very difficult to see anything uh, from the bank itself. And there's no public statement on whether, you know, the Chinese bank will withdraw from the uh, suspended project even until now. So that's one thing I want to highlight uh, from this project. So let me move on to the second project on uh, the Katlin uh, Hadon Rail Sky Railway in Vietnam, which was um, sealed. The MOU was sealed in 2009, and the construction started in 2011, and delayed until now. Although the although the Chinese company was trying to test, uh, and of course the delay was not just just not because of the the chinese company that has a lot to do with the with the, with the vietnamese uh government's governance capability uh, i want to highlight uh here uh, a very uh, the the charges on the on the project one thing is of course the increasing cost because of the you know lower bidding by the chinese company but that's kind of common uh for uh in international or for, at least for the Chinese construction companies at the international bidding. That, that's fine to a certain extent, but the second thing is from 2014 to 2016, at least seven incidents involved you know, death and casualties in that project. And in 2015, the Sixth Bureau of China Railway Engineering Corporation was charged for committing 16 violations by the Vietnamese government. And that was quite serious. Um, see, that, you know, on the other hand, obviously those uh, casualties and death or accidents violated Chinese, um, the Exim Bank on the 2007 uh, guidelines again, as well as the guideline on the green credit by the, the CRBC and the CRBC uh, key performance indicator, right? Um, and 
what is different uh, from Vietnam's case uh, is uh, Vietnam is uh, has a very you know um, uh, high level of you know control of the civil society, so we don't see really see um, the protests, but we see the rising Chinese sentiments towards. Uh, towards uh, the, the railway, uh, sorry, the SkyTrain uh, project itself. We've seen the, the net, I, I've been collecting the, you know, the online uh, comments and data. We've seen the rising uh, netizens, Vietnamese netizens uh, uh, complaints uh, and resentments towards Chinese uh, financing in the SkyTrain. Uh, while, you know, uh, on the other hand, the Vietnamese government ha had to, you know, react uh, on something, uh, react, you know, to 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 uh, face the rising uh, resentment towards the government to government um, deal. So, what did uh, Exim Bank do? Um, uh, well, we had what is different from the previous case uh, is I will give I will give details later. Uh, but first of all, uh, you didn't see any, you know, enforcement on the regulations uh, towards those violations. But something uh, changed since uh, President Xi Jinping visited uh, visit Vietnam in 2015 and make it publicly that, you know, this sky train should be as a core uh, demonstration project between China and Vietnam uh, under the framework of BII. And after the uh, Vietnamese uh, Prime Minister, I think it's Prime Minister, uh, you know, attendance on the uh, Belt and Road Forum in 2017, the Exim Bank uh, listed, uh, interestingly, listed the SkyTrain project as the one of the achievements in its overseas financing. Uh, well, you know, on, on the ground, there are still, um, you know, charges, violations on, on going. And right after that, the Exim Bank provided additional concessional loans, despite knowing, you know, uh, uh, the the problems ahead. So it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like uh, no return. Uh, the Exim Bank was uh, faced much limited choices, but to continue with this uh, financing journey. And and next is um, is is uh, Exim Bank has been improving on the publicity in terms of releasing its report. But I want to highlight, uh, I don't understand why, you know, it already started to issue, uh, already started to conduct those report, annual report, but it only make it public from 2018. So this, this is very difficult for, you know, for the researchers to track their activities. Um, that, that, could, that could probably be due to, you know, the some uh, you know institutional issues, but also could probably be due to the political identity, which they are not very sure uh, about the consequences of release of the reports, uh, especially in terms of accuracy. And last but not least, is one to highlight. Uh, you know, uh, in those reports, uh, the Exim Bank highlighted economic contributions while uh, blocking. Or I'm not saying Exim Bank is blocking. It it all of the Chinese media uh, block all the negative publicity on the on the SkyTrain. So that means the Chinese domestic audience uh, cannot play a monitoring role, uh, you know, to pressurize more uh, stringent regulations on overseas projects. Okay, now let me move on to the last case about the Jakarta River. Well, I think you need to be a bit quick on the last one. We're almost out of time. Sure, how, ma how, many, how many minutes? Just a couple of minutes, please. Okay. Sure. Okay. So the so the the Jakarta railway uh, railway uh, Jakarta Bandung railway similar thing uh, violations violation uh, of the Indonesian law and Chinese uh, regulations. But one thing different is uh, we've seen uh, you know the China Development Bank is has been balancing between the commercial entity and the political entity. Uh, first of all, the China, the CDB uh, required one hundred percent of land acquisition acquisition prior to loan disbursement. But the second is it agreed the loan applications without sovereignty guarantee, and that was uh, directed by the state level negotiations. So it, it, can, it can be considered as you know, not very um, viable commercial deals for CDB itself. Um, but on the other hand, it, it tries or it struggled to, you know, to get some returns. Um, but since to, uh, but since, uh, you know, uh, Jokowi visit Jokowi attended the buff in 2017 and also passed the new national spatial plan. We've seen the flexibility of the CDB uh, because the Jakarta Bandel Railway has been hailed as as uh, China's uh, one of the China's of uh, uh, you know uh, most demonstrative uh, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, railway diplomacy. So there's like the similar thing to Exim Bank in the SkyTrain. They they had to, you know, give in on the condition about uh, the EIA review. And the EIA review, according to the Indonesian law, uh, it should be conducted one year before the construction of the project, uh, like a size of the railway itself. Um, and also it give in on the, you know, uh, the, the lending uh, condition on the land acquisition. So they already agreed to release the loans. Um, and one of the largest NGO from uh, Indonesia, uh, the Wali uh, Java, uh, openly sent two letters on those violations, but there's no public response from the bank and no private response either um, confirmed by the NGO. So I find some findings. First of all, during the research, it's very difficult to, to, to get the information from the financing, uh, from China's financing. And second is the Chinese banks are very different from the AIIB uh, itself, you know, wh which, is, which it uh, established, particularly in uh, areas such as the grievance feedback. You, you barely see anything like this in Chinese for uh, policy banks. And third is heavy reliance on house governments leads to the asymmetric information and post this advantageous position to Chinese money. It's not like, you know, Chinese banks, they intentionally, you know, ignore those, those uh, problems. Sometimes they were pushed by, you know, by the political uh, incentives to give, to let the money uh, without being able to, you know, getting around the situation. And last second uh, finding is, um, uh, again, it's difficult. Uh, it's difficult to foresee those Chinese uh, policy banks to adopt the existing advanced principle. It, it has to be different from the rest of the, from at least from the, from the international standard practices. And the last final findings, I made the bold argument that the more the whole of government, government approach in, involves the more likely Chinese banks and firms can, can generate political and even diplomatic consequences, which I give, I provide the implications that, you know, it's, uh, it's a good time for the Chinese government to significantly transform the state of business relations inside China. Although I understand it's difficult, but probably the first step for the Chinese government and legis legis legislative bodies to do is to require those financial institutions to set a clear uh, punishment and incentive mechanism. One last point about this COVID-19 uh, context, uh, the BI is surely, you know, you know is surely being downsized but China needs to be really aware of the existing projects they found where the pandemic may access, exacerbate the situation of vulnerable people and the fragile and ecosystems if they can if they are un, if they cannot you know uh, improve on uh, the some of the you know controversial lending practices yes that's it thank you Great, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from any of our panelists? Maybe I can ask one question. Um, so uh, a lot of these projects financed by the state banks are being done by state-owned enterprises. And so you can also get governance on these projects through the, the SASAC or the people who are trying to incentivize the state-owned enterprises directly in terms of what the managers care about. So is there any coordination between like SASAC and the policy banks in terms of what kinds of things they should be supporting from big state enterprises? So that's a very good question, which I raised to actually to, to Lee Jones yesterday about this um, coordination, streamlining, you know, those dynamics, interactive dynamics. To be honest, I think I there's, there are different there are different analysis on this, but I it always a puzzle to me. You know, I can understand. You know, before Xi Jinping came into power, I, I can understand there this um, chaotic organ, uh, coordination. You know, different departments are, are striving for their own interests or political influences, and they mobilize um, and for resources and things like that. But since President Xi's, uh, uh, you know. Uh, 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 concentration power. I don't understand. I really don't understand how, how, how it is different. How how it is different from before. Clearly, we've seen uh, the concentration of power has streamlined certain, um, you know, overseas uh, business activities like more stringent, you know, uh, 
uh, assessment, right? But I, I, I have no really no clue, you know, to, and, and, and that's the puzzle that I, you know, I want to, I, I, you know, I want to address in the future, for, of course. Uh, but I think still there are some autonomy uh, and there's still, you know, this called bad dependence theory where, where those business actors, they can still, you know, uh, mobilize around a little bit, but within certain um, space with certain boundaries. Uh, but I will foresee, uh, you know, if she, uh, she, President Xi's um, control is going to be increasing, then it will be more uh, concern, concerning to the international audience because they would foresee Xi's call for those uh, for improving on the financial, you know, performance should be translated to the activities on the ground. But we don't, see, we really don't see that sub substantially at least now. So yes. So it's. Philip has a question. Philip, do you want to ask your question verbally? Yes, uh, Shui Gung, thank you very much. Um, where does Sinosure fit into this? Because their job is to advise the banks on risk, not least political risk. You didn't mention it. Please tell us what you found out. Hi, it's nice to see you <laughs> online. <laughs> Well, thanks for the question, Sanosure. Yes, very, very good question. I, I have, well, I have asked about Sanosure's role as well. Well, the, 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 or, uh, although I don't, I, I haven't done substantial research, but my impression uh, from the interaction with the people working there is that they sort of play the similar role of, uh, of those finance, of Chinese policy banks, uh, is particularly if it's state-backed projects. They have to, you know, uh, they they have to make the painful decision, you know, to to support that. But of course, as uh, as similar, you know, uh, they still need to uh, balance the financial returns, uh, the bailouts, uh, consequences, things like that. But it, it really depends on on to what extent, to what certain extent that if the manager. Um, is if the manager him or herself determines which comes the first is the political performance assessment or is economic performance assessment there is a central government backing up so why not i give it to you know <laughs> the projects backed by the government 